Ladies and gentlemen, we are getting absolutely spoiled with content this December, really every December, but uh, that does not exclude this December. So let's talk about it. Is it all good? Is it all bad? Is it a mix which would make the most sense? You'll find out. Sure. Of course, we have to be festive on this channel because we love the holidays and this time of year on EDPC Reviews. The first thing I want to cover, just getting right into it, is Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Uh, and let's get it out of the way. I love Guillermo del Toro as a director. I am not super familiar with all his work. I mean, I know all of his work. I just haven't fully seen all of it. I've seen The Shape of Water, which I adore, and I've seen Nightmare Alley, which I adore. And then I watched his little Netflix horror special earlier this year, The Cabinet of Curiosities, and I have my own review of that. Uh, let's just say that, and you can go watch it. Not too pleased with that one. But as for Pinocchio, this is one I was excited about for a while. Uh, way back when, when I did an Oscar... Um, not really prediction, but I was looking at potential Oscar contenders last year. This was for last year's ceremony, so where Coda won Best Picture. Uh, I did this way back when, so 2021, early 2021. And Pinocchio was one of the films I mentioned, because we all thought it was going to come out in 2021, uh, back in early 2021. I've said that way too many times. And uh, I, all I knew about it was that it was animated, and it was set in fascist Italy. And obviously, that's worthy of being excited. And then, you know, obviously attach Guillermo del Toro to that, and you have all the more reason to be excited. And Pinocchio did not let me down. The stop motion, the animation here is just, I mean, come on, let's not kid each other here. It's phenomenal. When you put a master uh, at work like this, you know they're going to put all the attention, time, detail necessary to craft this world and just make it unlike anything else. And animation as a medium is always something so special and stop motion in particular. Uh, some of my favorite films ever are stop motion animation. Nightmare Before Christmas, I adore that film. And uh, it just gives each, it gives so much fluidity with the, the character models that you use and obviously the backgrounds, the settings that you create. And it's a spectacular medium. As far as the story of Pinocchio, I'm not super attached to the story, but it is a classic obviously. And I think uh, it's one that gets adapted a lot. I didn't see the Zemeckis one that came out this year, but that was panned, obviously. And it feels like you get Pinocchios a lot these days. Obviously, you get a lot of different adaptations of a lot of different things, but Pinocchio does sort of stand out as a famous story that routinely gets adapted. And as far as adaptations go, my general philosophy about anything in life is do it different or do it better. And, uh, you know, whether this one did it better is certainly subjective for people to say. I don't really remember the original, so I'm not going to judge that that metric, but I will certainly say that it did it differently. It looked at the story, I assume, I don't know who wrote this actually, but whoever, I'm gonna say Del Toro, and that, that might be incorrect, but just as the director of the film, that's who I associate with this story. Del Toro looked at the story of Pinocchio, which has very, uh, you know, played out themes at this point, don't lie, yada, yada, yada. And he saw unique grounds to tell different kinds of stories with different kinds of themes. And obviously it still has all that original stuff, don't lie, all that, you know, we've seen this stuff before, but it also breaks new ground. And it uses this setting that it's created, like only Del Toro can think to put Pinocchio in fascist Italy. And obviously that's a head scratcher of an idea at first, but when you watch this film, it just makes so much sense with what they were going for. And so I think it was just a brilliant way to translate this old story that's been told forever and ever for humans. Uh, like uh, the original story was a book written in I think the 1800s. And it translates it not to the modern day, because obviously this is a story set in the past, but it translates it into a completely new story that audiences can love and appreciate on its own. It stands on its own outside of the original Pinocchio. And that is what makes it spectacular. Uh, I didn't really have any complaints with this one. It wasn't my favorite of the year. It's not my favorite Del Toro by any means. Uh, but as far as adaptations go, brilliant. I love it, the voice acting. Ellen McGregor as uh, Jiminy Cricket is hilarious, absolutely steals the show. And then I will also shout out Christoph Waltz as uh, the circus goer. I mean, the guy is 
the voice is so iconic. He's he's a legend. Uh, and then actually, I'll also say uh, Ron Perlman as sort of the uh, I forgot his name, but he's like the fascist the routine, you know, your, your local fascist in Italy, uh, and he does a pretty good job just speaking in his deep voice. But he's a commanding presence. Uh, overall, very much enjoyed Pinocchio. It is going to be an A. I would recommend checking it out. Now let's talk about Violent Night. It's fitting that I have this hat. This is the, if you haven't seen the trailers or something like that, David Harbour plays Santa, any sort of a John Wick type. He's uh, violent, hence the name, and uh, families snowed in, the super rich family is snowed in. They get robbed by these uh, criminals who want it. They're sitting on so much cash. I forget the amount, but it's millions and millions of dollars. And Santa comes to the rescue. Now, Violent Night very clearly, and it doesn't shy away from this, takes inspiration from two holiday classics, two of the best holiday classics, maybe the two best holiday classics. Die Hard, in the sense that it's about this uh, unsuspecting he lone hero who is able to use his wits to outsmart a ton of criminals who have taken people hostage uh, and save the day sneaking around the house and killing people when necessary. And then obviously Home Alone, the story of, you know, uh, a kid in a house who is able to use, again, his wits uh, to outsmart these criminals, make them look like fools, embarrass them completely, and uh, save the day and the spirit of Christmas. And then also you have the element of, I guess, a John Wick with sort of the hypersensitized violence uh, in order to make this a holiday classic for years to come. The only problem is that it doesn't feel original in any sense. And my main problem with Violent Night, first of all, is that it is trying to be a funny film. And while there were occasional moments of laughter, because I mean, the batting average here, uh, not the batting average, the amount of times it's up to the plate is staggering. The entire film is a comedy. There is so much comedy in moments that just make no sense. Uh, and I, that, that ties into my larger criticism, which I'll get into in a bit. But the film did not make me laugh nearly as much as it should have with a premise like this. As far as the violence goes, you know, maybe I'm just getting old, maybe I'm getting a square. But uh, when, you, when you see a film like John Wick, the violence all feels essential. There's something about it. And they just make it, they, they, the, 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 the weight of the violence in a film like John Wick isn't on the blood or the gore, though, you know, there's certainly elements of that, but it's more on the impact. They really do an excellent job, some of the best choreographed films of all time, of making you feel each hit, each gunshot, each everything, each sword, uh, what is it, like a puncture is not the right word, but whatever. Uh, and it's remarkable how they managed to do that. Violent Night focuses way too much on the wrong aspect of the combat which is the violence that follows. It is way too focused, in my opinion, on the gore of the fight. Uh, and, you know, you gotta balance it out. You need to have an, a, a good, it's gotta be scales, right? You need the, the, the gore, which obviously helps contribute to, to show you how violent something is, but you also need to focus on the impact. It can't be too high one or another, or else the scene just doesn't feel uh, fun, authentic, anything like that. Like when I go to see a John Wick and I see, you know, some crazy thing that he does that just feels awesome, I like, I, you know, curl back into my seat. I'm like, ooh, because it's fun, right? It's They managed to do it so spectacular. I have so much respect for those guys. I didn't feel that in Violent Night. But my main problem with Violent Night is that, to me, it has, it seems like it has no idea who its audience is. I don't know what they were thinking here. It's a rated R film. As I just established, ton of gore, a ton of gore, and yet the themes are all rather childish, uh, sorry to say. And I don't just mean, you know, spirit of Christmas, yada, yada, but the, it's about Santa's relationship with this girl, and he... Uh, wait, I'm gonna walk that back for a sec. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Okay, he gets, the at the end of the film, he dies and he gets revived by everyone believing in Christmas. And you also have obviously criminals taking people hostage here. And at one point, this really bothered me, a girl, their, the daughter runs off. She runs throughout the house and she's hidden. And then the parents in the room, all the rest of the family, but really the parents, because they're supposed to care, act like nothing happened. They just keep 
contributing with these conversations that these terrorists are trying to engage with them in. And their daughter is missing inside this house with these murderers. Like it's, it's not authentic. It doesn't feel real. And so the film is obviously trying to get you to suspend your disbelief, but how I can't take the film seriously if it's not taking itself seriously at certain points. Uh, and it feels like it wanted me to, right? It's not just trying to be a completely zany mess. Obviously it has those moments, but at the end of the day, I don't think it lived up to its promise. I did not really enjoy Violent Night. I don't know why I would watch this over a John Wick for the violence, a Home Alone for the fun gags, and a Die Hard for the awesome action. It falls flat on really all three fronts. Then I wanted to talk about, um, I don't know if you can hear that. I think I'll wait a little loud. Might, might be a minute. It's a garbage, it's a garbage truck. So, doing anything for Christmas? The holidays? New Year's? Oh. No, go ahead. Huh. Awesome. No, I've never been. That yeah, sounds like fun. Well, enjoy. Send some photos. Let me know how it is, of course. Me, I'm... Uh, we're going on a road trip. Yeah. No, yeah, I'm excited. It should be fun. It should be fun. All right, next up, we have Rick and Morty Season 6. And uh, I will say quickly, I would consider myself a Rick and Morty fan. I like Seasons 1 through 3 a lot. Not a big fan of seasons four and five. Most of it is largely forgettable. Season four especially has some uh, great episodes, like some of the best episodes of the show, but the overall arc, the overall arc of the season is not great. And season five is just a disaster. And season six started off pretty strong, I would say. The first couple of episodes really had me thinking maybe we're returning back to form. And then it just kept going and I started to feel the same stuff. The comedy here isn't as great. You start retreading a lot of the same meta. I, I, like, I get that the point of the show is supposed to be that it's a meta comedy on our society, on storytelling, on all sorts of things. Uh, but I just didn't ever feel like they were being super original with it. And I think Rick and Morty is, there already are, and they're only going to continue struggling with the idea of pointless storytelling. Just, they, they made the joke in season three, we're gonna go on forever and ever. And back then I was fine with it because you know, they were trending in the right direction. Every episode was funny, clever, original. And since then, you have sort you haven't really seen that. And obviously each season has its highlights, but I was especially disappointed here. Every other season has at least had some sort of arc that you, you go through and end on. And then the last episode sort of ends on a big cliffhanger. And I get that you can't do that every time, especially with Rick. It usually always ends with a cliffhanger of Rick doing something that puts the family in some precarious position. And I get that you can't do that every time, but this one ended with such a dud. It just felt like a traditional episode. Uh, and I was overall disappointed. I like shows that have storytelling. I'm fine with anthologies, but I do think a show is bettered when it follows some sort of structure. And so even if you're an anthological show, like a Rick and Morty for the most part, most of the prior seasons, all of the prior seasons, had through lines that would come up, come back, all sorts of things. And season six had it a little bit, you get a little bit of stuff in there, but nothing that really impressed me or was special. And you can see hints of stuff that they're going to keep doing in the future. Specifically, I'm gonna just slightly spoil part of season six here and what I think they might be going towards in the future. Rick has been pursuing uh, the Rick that killed his his wife. Uh, yeah, And like, first of all, it's not the most interesting premise, I guess, that they're really hyping this up for it to be something massive, uh, but I'm not super invested. We'll have to see where they go with it. But for this season to have just ended with, it feels like I kind of wasted my time is what it feels like. And I still have some fond memories of some of the episodes in this season, but overall I was pretty disappointed and I just have been getting more and more disappointed with Rick and Morty. And this hurts specifically because recently I made the connection 
Community is one of my favorite shows of all time. I watched it a few years back, you know, maybe two years ago, it was COVID, uh, on Netflix. And it just blew me away with how good it was. Seasons one, two, and three, noticing a pattern, are phenomenal. Some of the best television of all time. I really thoroughly enjoy it. Dan Harmon, who created both shows, he's the main writer of both shows, is brilliant, especially in Community. I really like what he's doing there. And then four, five, and six are not good. I don't want to say the show went on for too long because I think there's definitely potential for good storylines in four, five, and six, but for a whole multitude of reasons. Each season has its own reason why it was not good. Uh, but you've got the gas leak season. Yeah, I don't want to get into all that. But it fell off a cliff big time. Four, five, and six are not good. Uh, and they really bring down the show for me. And Rick and Morty is kind of doing the same thing. And so Community is six seasons. Rick and Morty so far is six seasons. So Rick and Morty ha has already reached that sixth season points. The four, five, and six, you're kind of, you're not, it's not a big as steep a drop off in Community is my opinion, but you're really trending downwards. And the longer the show goes on, the less I can excuse four, five, and six for being just such dumpster fire. So I hope it comes back to form with season seven. Uh, and I hope we can get some more of the classic Rick and Morty. Obviously it can change, no problem with it, uh, having to follow new formulas and whatnot, you know, because obviously they did a lot of the things that made the show so good, seasons one, two, and three, but you gotta find something new to pursue here that makes the show interesting. So if you ask me my opinion, uh, really think about the stories that you're churning out. Don't just make it aimless content that's mildly funny because that's not what makes Rick and Morty special. I could get that in a lot of other shows. What made Rick and Morty so special was these high concept, unique, hilarious ideas. Uh, even some, a show like, uh, episode like Pickle Rick, which gets made fun of a lot these days, but I still love that episode. That's the kind of stuff that makes Rick and Morty so well known. Uh, and so I think you gotta return to that. Uh, and get the through marks, right? Give each season its own little arc. You can even have it connect to the broader show, like they had the Evil Morty arc, which was really good and ended on such a dud in my opinion. But for a while, that was super intriguing. Uh, and so you just gotta find something there that you can tether each season with uh, in order to keep the audience invested. Next up, and this one is a massive surprise. I thought about giving this one its own video, but uh, I'm just gonna put it here. Avatar, The Way of Water, the sequel, the long-awaited sequel to the original Avatar film in 2009 has finally released. Quick forward, I don't know if I've mentioned it on this channel, but anybody who knows me knows I do not like the original Avatar. I get this isn't a new opinion, although, you know, you have seen a bit of a comeuppance of fans of the original Avatar these days, sort of a reevaluation, if you will, uh, a bit like the prequels, in my opinion, or anything like that. But I'm still not a fan of the original Avatar. I watched it recently in September, uh, when it re-released in theaters, just to see, because I never saw it in theaters, um, and it, it still, I still didn't love it. There were parts I liked, but for the most part, I still did not enjoy it. I thought it was unbelievably basic, uh, way too long, boring. I did not have any fun with it. I thought it was just a very generic film. And so I go into Avatar The Way of Water thinking the same thing. I'm not at all excited about its runtime not really looking forward to it. I'm obviously expecting the visual effects to be fantastic, so I know at the very minimum that I will get that. And then I sit down and I watch Avatar The Way of Water and I enjoyed it. First of all, I watched it 3D. 3D is fantastic, but the visual effects here, once again, are the standout. Just some fantastic visual effects. He is able to push the boundaries yet again and prove that he is James Cameron for a reason. But be even beyond the visual effects, because I don't think visual effects are enough to save a film. That's why I don't like the original Avatar. I can admire the visual effects of that film and how it looks and the world they created, but I still don't like it. Uh, but here you actually have much deeper themes. And I'll get into that. First of all, I do also just want to say, if I had a criticism, it would be that the film is way too long. Good Lord. And I don't think, unfortunately, that that's gonna stop with the other avatars, although I do think it would make them way better. I think I would actually certifiably call myself a big fan of the Avatar movies if they got shorter, because you know, the content here is looking good. Even if the original Avatar were shorter, I might like it. I wouldn't love it. Uh, I wouldn't like it nearly as much as The Way of Water, but I would still probably like it. But I don't because it's too long. 
Avatar The Way of Water, the acting, first of all, is a major step up. You still have some bits of dialogue that are, just do not work whatsoever, but way, like, I cannot even describe to you how little dialogue issues I had with this film compared to the original. And the script in general, it still follows a, a pretty basic uh, story, but what is underscoring that is so much more rich, in my opinion. Because you have the main thing here is the family bond. And Jake Sully as, uh, I forgot his, does he have an avatar name? I don't even know, maybe not. Uh, first of all, the a a acting is very good. And Neytiri, Zoe Saldana is just as good as she was in the first one. She's always been good in this series. And the family that they have here, it actually really touched me. I have to be honest, they have these four kids and they're looking for a new home and they have a lot of responsibilities that they got to handle. And I wasn't expecting myself to get as invested with this family as I did. But each of the children, this doesn't, this isn't always a thing when you have, you know, uh, sequels with families and whatnot. The families are super fleshed out. But, like, I don't mean to do this because I love this film. But Endgame, you look at, uh, maybe this isn't the most fair thing. But Tony Stark has his daughter, obviously, and they rely on some cheap tricks with the daughter. I love you 3000. She does the whole cheeseburgers line at the end of the film. You know, no tears from me because of that, because it's a little for, you know, forced, right? But the daughter doesn't exist as her own character. She exists as a way to make me feel more for Tony Stark. Each character of this family, from the little girl who doesn't get the most screen time, but she still is her own, to the older brother, each has their, their own person. They each have their own definable traits that makes them unique, that gives them individuality, and it makes them so much more valuable and special. And I am able to actually resonate with them and like them and appreciate what they're going for here. And so the real thing that Avatar The Way of Water, the thing that makes it stand out above its original and actually makes it a really good film is the family. I adore this family that James Cameron has given Jake Sully and Nate Theory. And then you also have the villain in the original, Quaritch, was just some general, you know, he was actually a pretty good actor. I always kind of liked Quaritch, uh, but very basic. I don't love him. And this film probably made me like that original version of him even less because here, I'm sorry to say, Cameron does sort of brilliant. It's a little simple, a little easy, but it's kind of brilliant turns Quaritch into a Na'vi. The thing he's fighting against is entirely, even as a Na'vi, he's fighting against the Na'vi. He is the thing he hates, but he can't deny how much power it gives him. And not only is the character design cool as hell, uh, but you still see that Quaritch in there, who is now also an avatar. I'm sorry to say, I, I dug it a lot. And the thing here, and this, obviously the potential for this is a lot stronger than what it is now, but the character of Spider, a human who was left behind, kept amongst the, the Avatar, the, the Navi, and his dad is Quaritch. And the idea of having a kid who grew up with the Navi, who doesn't like his dad, but is also not fully accepted by specifically Nate Thierry, doesn't fully accept him, Jake Sully kind of does, but you know, doesn't treat him necessarily as a part of his family, but the kids love him. It's a great dynamic. I really think the character of Spider has a ton of potential for the future. I'm excited to see what they do with him. And I think in general, James Cameron, since he got a lot of the exposition out of the way in the first one, he has more room to work with the character dynamics and all that sort of stuff and just really build out uh, the familial relationships of the world of Avatar. And I think that is special. And I'm excited to see what they anchor the third one with. Uh, if it's unique, if it's original, if something that I can enjoy, I'm looking forward to it a lot. So Avatar The Way of Water did surprise me. I very much like the film. The visual effects are great. A lot of the action scenes are fantastic, by the way. I was on the edge of my seat. One last thing I actually did want to mention. I can't believe I almost forgot this. Uh, I guess the high frame rate didn't bother me a ton. There were certain scenes where you definitely notice it more, but pretty much all the action scenes look like a video game. Uh, and you have that because of the high frame rate as well, but they like to do the zooms. I don't know who was the cinematographer on this film, but he always zooms in on everything, like the train going off the rails, zoom, the avatar flying in, zoom. It, it feels like a video game cutscene. I was ready to spam 
the or the quick time events. Obviously, there's literally every action scene in this film. I could probably be a video game cutscene. I want somebody to edit someday all these scenes into cutscenes because it will look uh, like it's straight out of a video game. So that's the only thing. I still enjoyed the action scenes for the most part, but maybe dial back on that front. Avatar The Way of Water is going to be an A. And I just realized I did not rate Violent Night or Rick and Morty Season 6, but I probably put something up for those, so it's fine. Next up, we have Sam Mendes' film, Empire of Light, the Olivia Colman uh, film about she works in a theater in uh, you know London or, or something like that. I don't know, some English city. And it is not great. A lot of people have already spoken about this one, so I don't intend to speak for too long. Cinematography is pretty good. It's from the legend himself, obviously. I am forgetting his name. Deakins, Roger Deakins, the legend. Uh, frequent collaborator with Sam Mendes, who is a director I admire quite a bit, by the way. Uh, but the film here, I don't really understand its goal. That was the main issue I had with it. Is it about the magic of cinema? Slightly. If you want to call it that, that is the f like fourth most important theme of the film, maybe, at best. But the film is trying to be about a lot, and in that, it is about nothing. The film is way too broad in its focus and never hones in on anything. That was the metaphor I wanted to use. I can't believe I didn't use it. When I, when I left this film, I really wanted, I liked the metaphor of Sensio. He wants it to be about the magic of film. They try so hard to get everything in one shot, but everything is unfocused. Everything in the shot is blurry. And so as a result, it just looks like a mess. It looks like a mess. Uh, and it's a beautiful mess because it's Deacon's shot, but it's still flawed, completely flawed, and uh, has almost no purpose. I don't know why I'm ever going to watch this film again. It didn't make me feel anything particularly. It felt like kind of a waste of two hours. It's got some great performances. Olivia Coleman, as always, very good. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Michael? I think it might be Michael, but it's the E is in front of the A, so I'm not sure. But Ward is, this is the first time I've seen him in anything. He's very good. He's super charismatic, so I like that a lot. Toby Jones, I kind of just like, he's kind of, I just like him as sort of a character actor. He's always there doing something in the side in all these movies, but I enjoyed him. Uh, and beyond that, very little praise for this film. I didn't hate it. I don't mean to sound too harsh, but it just doesn't feel very focused. And the, the more I think about it, the less I like it, because what point does it serve uh, if it's not going to try to uh, attach itself with any specific theme and it's just so interested in being a broad generalization of so many things instead. Uh, so Empire of Light is going to get, for now, a C. Wanted to quickly uh, review the World Cup because it is an event that for the first time in my life really I was able to follow. I watched obviously the 2018 World Cup in bits and pieces. I watched the 2014 World Cup, really just the final back then, that's all I can remember. But this is the first one I followed from the beginning to the end, uh, and I can say that it was a blast. It was a blast. So and maybe that's not my call to say whether or not it was the best World Cup or anything like that, but I can say I had an absurd amount of fun following it along. It was great rooting for the US, and then obviously they uh, bit the bullet. Nobody expected them to get far. I've always been a big soccer fan in general. I like soccer. Uh, and it was a ton of fun following this along. It was really just so many perfect narratives that happened repeatedly. And a lot of these games were fantastic. Obviously you have some duds because soccer can be boring, but really when you got to the semifinals here, you have the Morocco underdog story. I really liked rooting against Croatia because I had some friends rooting for Croatia and it was fun to sort of bicker with them. Uh, Argentina, can't deny the story. And really France as well. I always liked Mbappe as a player. Uh, and even going back to the, you know, the 2018 World Cup win, a repeat for France is also just such an incredible story. And that final, good lord, I'm still thinking about it. I probably won't forget that anytime soon because what a game that was. Uh, so the World Cup is going to get the highest of A's from me. Can't quite give it an S, it's not my favorite thing of all time, but my God, it doesn't get a lot better than this when it comes to sporting events. I had a great time and I'll see you all again for the World Cup in 2026. Two last things I watched last night that I want to touch on. The Murderville Christmas Special. I think it's called, no, I'm not even gonna try. It's got a long title. Uh, and it was good. 
I'll say it was about as good as the show. And actually, the, the show I was able to review on my first ever arc. So my first ever one of these videos where I discussed a lot of things in the same video uh, way back in February or March, way back in March, I reviewed the show. I liked the show a lot. Pretty funny, improv comedy, nothing groundbreaking, but I enjoyed it. And I thought the same thing with this one. This one was actually probably my favorite of all the sort of Murderville episodes. Uh, and that's because they go bigger. It's obviously themed, so I think it's a lot more interesting. It's the funniest, in my opinion. Jason Bateman, I love. Maya Rudolph blew me away. She was hilarious in this one. And then I won't spoil one little surprise that you get in there if you want to watch it yourself. But it's a ton of fun. If you haven't seen the show, they're really short. There's like six episodes and they're pretty short and they're funny. Uh, I would definitely maybe even start with this one because I think it'll hook you in uh, and show you all you need to know. Uh, I liked it a lot. It's going to be a B again because, you know, nothing groundbreaking, nothing super special, but very enjoyable. And then it sucks to be ending the video with this one, but I have to. I waited to make this video until I saw this. But it's going to be Bardo, False Chronicle of a Handful of Truths from Ale Alejandro... No, I'm not going to say that. Alejandro Gonzalez in your Ritu. Uh, A-G-I. Nobody ever says that, huh? A-G-I, I just made that up. In your Ritu is what everybody calls him. And um, I, again, am not super familiar with his work. I have seen Birdman. I would like to see The Revenant. I was planning to watch it before this, but I never got around to it. Uh, and I like Birdman a lot. I think it's a great film. And I can obviously see now uh, the sort of similarities between a film like Birdman and Bardo. And I will say up front, I appreciated aspects of Bardo. It is obviously a very personal story to Inuri too. I like a lot of the themes that are being explored here as it relates to Mexican identity. Uh, and also, you know, Mexicans living in America who are trying to uh, sort of balance the struggle between their identities. Uh, it has a lot to say about journalism, about storytelling. It has a lot to say about a lot. Uh, but I hate this film. Maybe that's a strong word because, again, I appreciate a lot. I like what he was going for. He's clearly an artist with a vision. But my God, if this wasn't the most boring film of the year, probably. And the reason for that is you have so... It's a very surrealistic film, right? He's obviously trying to create these unbelievable... Uh, scenarios that are just ridiculous and very high concept stuff. It looks like pretty, pretty high budget with a lot of the stuff that they pull off here. Looks fantastic, I won't lie. But uh, it is a mess. It feels like Inuritu was challenged to drag out each scene for as long as he could. And I'm a little baffled because apparently this is the cut down version. The original was even longer. So I am a little baffled as to how he could possibly have uh, cut this down to where we got it now, to the version I saw, because holy mother of God, does it take its time. And as a result, uh, like I get that he wanted, uh, I think he, this, this character, I think, my interpretation is that he's obviously supposed to be uh, a version of Inuri too, because he says a lot of the things, even in story, it's sort of meta where he's like, uh, he's imagining, he's telling other people about this surrealistic world that he's imagined. And these are scenes that we've already seen in the film. And uh, it just doesn't work. It feel, A lot of people have called it self-indulgent, uh, pretentious. I kind of agree, but I think it, it detracted from the point that he was trying to tell by the way that he just made everything so muddled in surrealistic ideas. And again, high concept scenes. Uh, that just really doesn't get to the point that he was trying to make. Uh, but also, I just didn't enjoy the film. And so when you're, when you're not engaged with the film, when you're bored by just how long some scenes are going on, it's very hard to want to understand what he's trying to say or to appreciate that even more. Uh, and so I get what he was going for. I get that some people like this film a lot. I can appreciate that. I still have a ton of respect for Inuri 2 as a director. I still very much like Birdman. But Bardo is unfortunately one of my least favorite films of the year because I cannot understate how bored I was during this film. I tried. I really, really tried. But uh, Bardo is going to be a D. Uh, did not enjoy this film. And my only advice would be maybe cut it even more. All right, folks. So, wow, that was a long one. But that is going to be the December arc, possibly part one, because we got a lot of other films coming out soon. I'm going to see The Whale today. 
I'm going to see Puss in Boots, The Last Witch, probably tomorrow. I'm going to see Babylon come Thursday, most likely. After Sun is still on my radar, a film I need to see. What else do you have? You have White Noise coming out at the end of the year. Broker. I don't know if that's coming out in America by the end of the year, so we'll have to see for that one. Some other films. A Woman Talking, of course, is a film I've been super excited about for a while. Uh, lots of films to see, lots of films to catch up on, talk about, but we are drawing the year to a close. So folks, if you've seen any of the things that I talked about in this video, please let me know down below. I would love to hear your thoughts on them, uh, the ratings you would give them, if you agree or disagree with any of my criticisms. I tried to be more thorough uh, with the things I said in this video, so I hope you appreciated that, or maybe I went on for a little too long and I was perhaps self-indulgent. You can let me know if that was the case as well. Folks, I have an EPC Reviews. In case I don't see you before uh, the holidays, uh, happy Hanukkah, by the way, for all the fellow Jews out there. Uh, and, but in case I don't see you before the end of the holiday season, I most likely will. Uh, but happy holidays. Enjoy. Spend time with family. You know, enjoy the vacation you were telling me about earlier. That's going to be an odd comment if I don't end up keeping that portion of the video in the final cut, folks. Meow. Bye-bye. Happy Hanukkah.